these uh, uh, talks that have been given in this room. Um, and actually, the, the very earliest set of these talks uh, led to some fantastic discussions with Bob and Pierre and uh, Mark that were really instrumental, really instrumental for us making a, uh, a lot of progress. Um, but uh, then there's been a number of layers of developments uh, uh, after that. And um, I'd like to tell you about our uh, uh, latest thinking about uh, this, uh, this uh, general subject and the kind of uh, geometries or uh, positive geometries <coughs> that uh, we've run into and how we're uh, thinking about them. And also give you an, an idea of still what some of the really outstanding uh, open problems are and some really sort of magical facts about the objects that we're talking about that we don't understand at all, that we hope some, uh, some, some, uh, uh, some, some deeper understanding will, will, will make more transparent. So um, since I'm assuming that not everyone has seen all these talks going back four years or five years, <laughs> uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to assume that. Uh, so let, let, yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. <laughs> That's right. So that, that was the way out for all the people who have seen the talks for the past four or five years. Uh, I'm, I'm going to divide the part, uh, the uh, uh, talk into a, a few parts. Um, so just first, some uh, general uh, introduction and motivation from the physics, what the objects are from the, uh, from the physical point of view that we're talking about. Um, these are uh, relate, related to uh, scattering processes for ordinary particles like uh, quarks and gluons um, uh, in, a, in a slightly idealized uh, toy model that has a lot of uh, symmetry, the maximally supersymmetric version of the theory of the strong interactions. <clears throat> Although unlike most of what is done has been done in theoretical physics for the past 30 years, where the toy models that you talk about are really quite far from reality. Um, here, the toy model is closer to reality than any other toy that people have played with <laughs> over the last three decades, uh, in the sense that of the leading order of approximation, it's identical to reality. Okay? So, so we'll be talking about something called uh, tree amplitudes, for example, and uh, that the, the simplest version of this geometry, the amplitohedron, involves trees. And these objects literally compute the high energy scattering of gluons when you collide protons, not just in exotic places like the Large Hadron Collider, but billions of times a day when cosmic ray uh, protons hit uh, atoms in the atmosphere. <laughs> these experiments are done by human beings. <laughs> They're done by nature. It's, uh, it's something which happens in nature all the time. And the things that we're talking about literally describe those processes to so the leading order of uh, uh, approximation. <coughs> OK. Uh, so it'll just be a little bit of uh, 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 motivation from the physics. Then, as far as the mathematical talk, uh, part of the talk goes, there are really two, two parts. And I'll mostly, at least in the first part of the talk, there is a geometry. This is, the, this is related to positive Grassmannians. Um, but it's uh, something which is extended to what we call the amplitohedron. And the rough relationship between a positive Grassmannian and an amplitohedron is that the positive Grassmannian is like the inside of triangles, and the amplitohedron is like the inside of polygons or polytopes. Okay? So it's a Grassmannian generalization of polygons and uh, polytopes. But uh, there's a geometry on one hand, and there is a certain canonical differential form that has the property that it has logarithmic singularities d log, d log, logarithmic singularity. So locally, uh, all the singularities of the differential form look like dx1 over x1 up to dx uh, n over xn for some good choice of, uh, of, uh, of the coordinates x1 through xn. Uh, so there's a canonical differential form with logarithmic singularities uh, on and only on all the boundaries of this space, of the uh, amplitohedron. Now, <clears throat> so, so there's two things. There's a geometry and there's the form. The physics is, is extracted from the form. Okay? So ultimately, we're, we're going to get some numbers that you can hand to experimentalists that the physics is associated with the form. But the form is a slave to the geometry. Okay? So, so what I'll spend uh, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the talk doing is telling you about um, ways of thinking about the uh, better ways of thinking about the uh, geometry. First, our original way, but then better ways of thinking about the geometry. Uh, I should say that this, this general connection between geometries um, 
uh, regions that have boundaries of all possible dimensions going all the way down from top uh, dimensional down, down to points, uh, which have associated with them these uh, canonical differential forms. This seems like an interesting subject of study just mathematically by itself. Uh, together with my student Yantao Bai, who's there, and Thomas Lamb, we just had a, a paper out uh, a few weeks ago uh, initiating a sort of exploration of this subject in general, not necessarily tied to Grassmannians, but in, uh, just, just thinking about this, uh, this question more broadly and generally, it's, it's a, I think it's a very, very interesting subject. Uh, but um, but uh, probably, at least for the first part of the talk, I won't focus so much on the uh, issue of related to the forms. Yeah. At, yeah. Is it, is it, are they regular objects or are they got singularities? They have singular, well, they have boundaries. They have boundaries of all they possible, boundaries. yes. They have boundaries of all possible uh, dimensions. Yeah. Oh, they have boundaries of all? Yes, possible. yeah. So they have, they, they, I forget the, the word for it. Uh, uh, a, a simplicial complex, no. It's, a, a Conjecturally regular pseudo complex? There you go. Okay, yes. The problem in question yes. is within bigger meromorphic. Yes, yes. It, you know, it, is a, it is a meromorphic complex form. Okay? It is a meromorphic complex form, and that's, that's this fascination, is that there is a meromorphic complex form whose entire structure is dictated by positive geometry. That's the, that's the funny thing. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, once you specify the geometry, then, then this form is... Once you specify the geometry, conjecturally, the form is, is unique okay? and is specified by it. But um, amongst other things, uh, we'd like a better, that's, that's what I'll talk about in a second part of the talk if people are interested. I think that the, 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 the plan is that we'll, talk, we'll have a normal talk and then whoever's interested, we can talk about other things. So I, I'll, I'll talk about things related uh, to the form probably in the, uh, in the, in the second part um, uh, and talk mostly about the uh, geometry in the uh, first one. So, um, all right, so, so that's the, that's the uh, plan. Uh, I should say that, uh, this is all, this is a work that should come out with uh, uh, Hugh Thomas um, and uh, Yaroslav Trinka. And probably some of you know uh, Hugh, he's a mathematician at the University of Montreal. And as I like to say in these talks, uh, it's wonderful. I've known him since I was in grade 10 and he was in grade 9. <laughs> and uh, after all these years, it, it just so happens he knows everything that one needs to know about cyclic polytopes to be useful <laughs> for our subject. So it was really wonderful that we got to uh, uh, work together on this. Okay, and it should be coming out. The, the paper should be coming out pretty soon. All right, so, uh, so first a little bit about the, the physics. And um, let me uh, translate things uh, in directly the language uh, that, that we'll need. Very naively, we're thinking about the scattering of a bunch of particles. Uh, these could be gluons. So there's n particles, 1, 2, 3, up to n. And um, also, uh, these particles uh, are charged in some Yang-Mills uh, gauge group. So they, they, they have gauge indices uh, associated with them. And uh, for, for a variety of natural reasons, we're, it's going to be useful for us to think of them as being cyclically ordered. <laughs> Okay, so they're not just, uh, they're not n random points, they're, they're n points with a naturally a cyclic ordering uh, associated with them. Um, one reason of thinking about why there's an ordering is if you imagine that they, that they, were, uh, that, that they were charged under adjoints under uh, SUN, then we could uh, associate with each one of these uh, uh, arrows in opposite directions that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that tell you about uh, uh, transformations under, under UN. Um, uh, with a U and a U dagger on that, on that line. And with this sort of uh, notation uh, in a natural limit, all the diagrams that you would draw would need to be planar. Okay? And, and if they're planar, the, uh, uh, in, the in the limit of a large number of colors, there's naturally an ordering for each one of the particles. <coughs> and also, you have a bunch of momenta, and all the particles are massless. And it turns out all of that data is conveniently represented, and, and I won't go through the uh, dictionary, but it's a very simple algebraic dictionary, by just giving a bunch of points, uh, a bunch of uh, four-dimensional vectors. So the momenta are, the momenta are four-dimensional vectors that satisfy a constraint that uh, p squared is equal to zero, so there's really three degrees of freedom associated with each one. 
and we're going to represent it by giving another set of four-dimensional vectors. So these are uh, uh, four-dimensional vectors. So these are going to be in C4, or, uh, or uh, in most of the talk, I'll actually imagine they're in R4. Um, and actually, we also have a rescaling symmetry on each one. So really, I'm talking about either CP3 or, uh, or uh, just the real projective space uh, P3. Okay? So uh, that's the three degrees of freedom associated with every point now is now uh, mapped into, uh, into that. So all we have, as far as the data goes, is n points in P3. And it'll be useful for us to do deprojectivize and really think about endpoints in R4. So mostly it'll be real. OK, so, um, so that's all the data there is. Um, so these are, the, these are your external momenta. These, are, these, these Zs are the external momenta. Okay. Now, something that you probably know about. Uh, uh, what yes. Is the conservation of momenta? Ah, beautiful. The uh, conservation of momentum uh, uh, and the way to associate momenta with these z's is, uh, is the uh, following. So, um, so uh, it's the, uh, it's the uh, I can say it as the uh, Klein correspondence between uh, lines in P3 and points in, uh, in a four-dimensional uh, in a, in a four space. Okay? So, uh, so what physicists would call the uh, twister uh, correspondence. But if I have these points in uh, P3, uh, z1, z2, uh, Etc. Then associated with any line in this space is a point back in uh, in R three one. Actually, if I literally do it as real, uh, it's in R two two. So each line there is associated with a with a point. And the fact that the lines one intersect the other tells me that this point x1, x2, x3, so that's associated with the line 1, 2, that's associated with the line 2, 3, and so on. The fact that the lines here intersect tells me that, that uh, every adjacent pair of points is null separated. Okay, so, so x1 minus x2 squared is equal to 0. And so if you think of this, uh, uh, if you think about the polygon formed by these guys, then the edges of the polygon each edge has a momentum, pa mu, is xa plus 1 mu minus xa. So this trivializes the fact that momentum is conserved, okay, and that they're all null. So this first uh, basic twistorial correspondence is absolutely crucial to, uh, to help us get going. Now, now we're talking about, always you normally talk about data in this constrained way. It's conserves momentum and it's null, whereas now we're just giving these freely given these endpoints in uh, these endpoints in uh, R4 or in really in uh, P3. So the fact that you have a polygon and they're yes. gives you these Exactly, points. exactly. So we could go backwards. We could go backwards <laughs> and we could say that, uh, that, that given that there's an ordering, it makes sense to do this. Without an ordering, it doesn't make sense to do it. I have a bunch of momenta. I don't know how to make a polygon out of them, right? But given that, there's a, given that there is an ordering, I can make a polygon. And then I can use the Klein or the twister correspondence to map it back to, uh, to uh, uh, P3. And there are many beautiful things about this. Um, so, uh, part of the reason, maybe this is a general point I can make, but, but, but you, you, you can wonder why it is that Grassmannians are showing up in talking about scattering problems at all. Because it's one of these, it's at zeroth order, it comes out of left field a little bit. But why are they related to each other at all? And it's, and it's related to a simple but deep fact about the symmetries of space-time in four dimensions. The Lorentz group in four dimensions, the complex Lorentz group uh, in four dimensions is SL2C cross SL2C. Okay. So there are these SLs uh, everywhere. And the conformal group, SL4C, the complexified uh, conformal group is SL4C. And so given that it's SL4, you should work with the variables on which the SL4 acts like linear transformations. Okay? And that's these Zs. It's not points in space-time. It's not momenta. It's these twister variables, Z, 
on which the symmetries act in the most obvious way. And the reason Grassmannians are showing up is simply because we have these vector spaces with linear transformations everywhere. And so it's, uh, uh, so it's very natural to have uh, uh, but let me just, just finish saying uh, a little bit about the uh, physics. Um, uh, just one more thing about the physics. So uh, when we do these things in conventional ways, um, if we calculate things with the uh, uh, scattering process with uh, Feynman diagrams, for example, we would draw diagrams like this or more complicated ones if you have uh, more legs and so on. So, um, so uh, part of the thing that's been said many times is that when you do these calculations, you get horrendously complicated intermediate expressions that simplify drastically, uh, hundreds or thousands of pages that simplify drastically to one term or a few terms. So that, that was already from 30 years ago, an indication that there had to be some, not just tricks or some other way of doing the calculation, but some other structure that, that uh, determines the answer from a, from a different uh, starting point. That's what we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, in, in, in the rest of the talk. But anyway, when you draw diagrams like that, that's what you get in, at, at leading level. Uh, and then you could also have diagrams that have closed loops on the inside. And uh, these are things that, that have the more intrinsically quantum mechanical uh, corrections in them. And all I want to uh, describe is how we should think about these loops. So of course, when you actually perform the loop integrations, you get some final answer. Uh, which might have dialogarithms or more complicated functions. Uh, at one loop, you get uh, dialogues. Uh, you get uh, uh, much more interesting functions at higher loops. Uh, and um, anyway, there, there's, a, there, 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 there's a whole story. Uh, but we're going to concern ourselves with the integrand of these expressions uh, before you do the integrations. That, that has a huge, that, in other words, it, it's the guts of what, all, what, what these pictures actually, uh, uh, what, yeah, it's, 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 it's what these things uh, look like before you do the uh, integration that still has a huge amount of information about the uh, uh, physics in it. In a sense, it has more information in it that you're removing when you do the integral to get the uh, final answer. So this sort of integrand object knows more about what's going on. And it also has the advantage of being just a rational function. Okay? It's a, in fact, it's a, it's a form uh, in general because we have to integrate over, over uh, this guy. So for example, here, um, uh, uh, but, so, but the way I'm going to think about it is that each loop is actually associated with another point x in the same space that we talked about. <laughs> okay? So uh, in, this, in, in this space of the polygon, um, uh, each, each external momentum, uh, I mean, I'm really drawing the dual diagram here. So each, each external momentum is like x2 minus x1, x3 minus x2, and so on. But the loop is another point, and then I, I, the, the momentum of that line, if that's x1, would be x minus x1, x minus x2, and so on. Okay? So for instance, the form that, that would go along with a picture like that would be d4x over x minus x1 squared over x minus x4 squared. Okay? We'd have, uh... So at loop level, the uh, data is, now I have to take this back to the uh, space of the z's. So at loop level, each one of those x's is now going to go uh, and turn into some line in this uh, P3. Okay, so, uh, uh, so I have a bunch of points. And then, I, and then if I have L loops, I also have uh, L lines. Let me call them L1, uh, L sub capital L. Um, uh, these are lines in P3, or I can really think of them as two planes in four dimensions if I think of them in R4. Okay? So that's what the data is. So if you want, if you want the form at 10 loops, you have a whole bunch of uh, vectors in R4, or in C4 in general, and you have a bunch of two planes in four dimensions that correspond to the loop integration points. Okay, and uh, at loop level, there's some form. Um, uh, there, there, there's some form associated with these guys. Now, there's something else that uh, uh, there's a final bit of information that you need, which is to specify the spins of all the particles. So these are particles like gluons that can have spin one or minus one. Uh, we make the, the theory uh, supersymmetric, so we have uh, so we have uh, other partners. Uh, the gluons have spin plus one or, and minus one. They're particles of spin a half and minus a half and spin zero. So these are all 
grouped together in a big multiplet, and all of that information is uh, all of that information is contained in some other variables that go along with the z's. And these are some Grassmann variables. Okay, these are some Grassmann variables that are uh, that are standardly seen in whenever you talk about uh, supersymmetry. Um, part of the part of the thing that uh, we'll 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 be talking about. Uh, is that uh, in, in this way of thinking about the uh, geometry, all this stuff is going to go away and is going to be uh, replaced with something um, uh, much more natural, I think, from a uh, so mathematical so point of view. So right. your geometry will involve both the grass It will not. The geometry will be completely so standard be bosonic geometry. So exactly. It, it'll be all stripped out, and that's part of the interesting point, is, is that, that this... Good? It's a very good thing. It is a very good thing to do. And that's, that's, that's part of the point we'll see, is that these super objects, super amplitudes, uh, we are going to be interpreting towards the end of the, when I get to talk about the form as just a form, just a differential form on this space. No funny Grassmann variables. There is a differential form on the space of the z's and the lines. Okay? So there's some form on that space, and that form is the super amplitude. And in fact, the Grassmann parameters are just the dz's of the differential forms. Okay, something. Uh, so, so uh, that's part part of the point is that uh, uh, it's not super geometry; it's ordinary geometry. But uh, but the presence of uh, <coughs> uh, Grassmannians either um, in front or behind the scenes is responsible for the emergence of the supersymmetry. Yeah. Absolutely crucially. Yeah. Okay, yeah. absolutely yeah. crucially. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, it, it's a little bit funny because it's the same Mr. Grassman who gave us the variables as well as the planes. So they're, 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 not, uh, they're not a priori related to each other. But what the interesting thing is is that, the, uh, is that uh, things that are natural to the Grassmannian geometry end up being supersymmetric. It's not a, it's not a trivial statatement. That's right. The z's are cyclically ordinal, and lines are not. The lines, in fact, are a permutation invariant between them. OK? OK? And so let me just finally give you two examples of expressions for what the amplitudes look like, um, just, just, just so you see uh, uh, what they are. Um, so one of them, uh, so, the, 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 so, so, so the amplitudes are, uh, the, the amplitudes are labeled by the number of particles, the number of loops, of course, um, and uh, by another variable k that I'll define in, uh, in, in a second. Well, uh, k is, uh, <coughs> this is some expression which is just the polynomial in, the, in those etas uh, of degree four, 4 times k. Okay. So we have four of these z's and we have four of these etas. <laughs> Okay, so the, the z's are four vectors. We have, uh, we have four of the etas. So, so the k here means when you do this expansion that it's something that has degree four times k in the uh, etas. In a moment, the four is going to be replaced by a general number, uh, by general integer m. But, uh, but in physics, that's, that's, that's what we get. And so let me give you the two simplest non-trivial examples. Well, the most trivial one of all is k equals 0 and l equals 0 which by some uh, useful normalization is just normalized to be 1. Okay? So the first non-trivial example is for n and k equals 1 and l equals 0. And this looks, this was an expression that was computed 10 years ago. Um, and it looks like something like this. I'll explain what this bracket is in a second. Uh, but I'll give you, let me give you another formula, k n equals 0, and now one loop. And here's another kind of bracket, 1 i i plus 1 comma 1 j j plus 1. OK, and let me just, uh, just, just for the purposes of uh, writing something down, so this first bracket with, with five guys is Second funny bracket
Yes. OK, so everywhere in this talk, well, you, well, we see something in brackets. They're, they're, contract, they're just uh, they're determinants. OK, so they're just uh, uh, contracted uh, anti-symmetrically. Uh, <coughs> um, and so uh, and remember, these etas have, uh, have four indices. So when I'm taking them uh, to the fourth, I'm just taking the anti-symmetric product of four expressions that look that look 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 like that together. All right. So now um, the only thing I want you to take away just a there are these some simple concrete expressions here. The line is thought of as a so in an expression like this, the z's are four vectors. Remember, so the, so this l is a two plane in four dimensions. So I can canonically contract the two plane with four in four dimensions with any two other two vectors. That's what these uh, objects are. And uh, up here, 1 i plus 1 intersects 1 jj plus 1 is a line in P3. Again, that I can, uh, these are two planes. They, can, they intersect on a line, and I can contract it with this, uh, with this other line. OK? Yeah. Yeah. So let me begin with the first one, the 1, 2, 3, 4. Yes. Yeah, 1, one, one 2, 3, 4 is you just put z1, z2, z3, z4, and you take the determinant of that matrix. OK, so it's just contracting them with the uh, anti-symmetric yeah, tensor. And the same everywhere. The brackets are the same. So, so this 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 thing is. So I can think of L as being. Uh, uh, I I can think of L as being a two plane. That's the span of L one and L two. Let's say, and so uh, so L uh, I L A B would just be this determinant L one L two A B. They're all four by four determinants. These are all uh, four by four determinants. And all I want you to see from these expressions is, for example, uh, I told you that, that all of these things are supposed to be cyclically invariant, and yet this doesn't look cyclically invariant. Here, like particle one is playing a privileged role, the same here. Okay? And associated with that, these have all, the, 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 they have prescribed poles. The only poles that they're allowed to have um, uh, would be when. Uh, I and I plus one and JJ plus one become uh, coplanar, for example, um, or when this line intersects I and I plus one. And so these are indeed poles of each one of these expressions. There's all kinds of spurious poles as well that, that of course, cancel in the, uh, that cancel in the assumption. Okay? This is a complicated rational expression. These are just complicated rational expressions. I just want you to see what they look like. Okay, so they're, and in fact, this is really a form. This is really a form. I need to multiply this by, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's the prefactor of, um, yeah, yeah uh, b b I, uh, th th this is, this is I, I have to multiply it by the, uh, by the, by, by the form uh, on, on the space of lines in, uh, in, on the space of two planes in four dimensions. Okay, it's just the, uh, it's the, it's a prefactor in front of that, uh, of that form. OK, good. So in general, uh, in general, uh, this is, in, in the usual way of thinking about this thing, it's an expression. This is a polynomial in etas of degree 4k. And a form, uh, which is a form of degree 4 times L, if you have L loops. Okay, and it's 4 because uh, uh, the space of two planes in four dimensions is four dimensional. Okay, it's just g to 4 is four dimensional. So for each one of them, I have. Uh, Four degrees of freedom. So it's maximum degree. Yes, yes. It is maximum degree in this exactly. It's maximum degree uh, in the in in the space where the where, where the where the lines are uh, uh, moving around. Just to hop ahead, um, uh, we're going to see that there's a much more natural way of thinking about this as a four times k plus l form with no etas, no etas at all, but a four times k plus l form just on the space of the z's and the lines. And that's after you stripped out the, right? after, after I do all the stuff uh, that I haven't told you about yet. But, but there's going to be a picture for the amplitude, just to jump to the end. There's going to be a picture for the amplitude um, directly on the configuration space of the standard bosonic data as a differential form. Okay? Uh, now, this differential form is going to have some special properties. It'll have logarithmic singularity somewhere. It'll be there's some image of this object, the amplitohedron, just in this space. Okay? Um, uh, um, and then when you extract out the, the pieces, there's a 4k piece. So there are pieces of this form that have 4k dz's 
Okay? And, and we can identify these dz's with these Grassmann variables of the, of the super objects. Okay? But, but now in this space, it's not top dimensional anymore. Okay? So it's, uh, yes? Where are the etas in your expression for one loop? Oh, there's nothing there. Because at one loop, k is 0. Uh, uh, sorry, because I've done k equals 0, so there happens to be no, no etas there at all. OK, so that's, uh, so, so all I wanted to see, we have these forms. They're, they're given in very simple ways, but which obscure some obvious symmetries. Uh, and uh, the things that I, I've talked about here, again, this, this introduction has been given in these talks like, basically every time. Um, and the picture that, that emerged associated with the amplitohedron was that these formulas and forms uh, are, are really related to uh, some geometry, to the, the geometry of this object, the uh, uh, amplitohedron. Um, and these formulas are actually correspond to triangulations of this uh, geometry. We can, tri we can triangulate the geometry in many, many different ways. But, uh, but, um, but, uh, but there's a geometry that can be triangulated. And once you understand the geometry, you can go back um, and, uh, and find the uh, associated form. All right, so. So, so far, you, you've not made specific use of the fact that you've got trees. You're, you're using your. Yeah, like here, here, I'm just, here, here I've, I've finished introducing the, if you like, the, the kinematical part of, of, of the story. Okay? So, so, this is the space on which everything is defined the space of Zs and lines uh, and, 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 and two planes. And amplitudes are some functions or forms on the space. They come from some particular, they come from Feynman diagrams and path integrals and all, all the rest of it. And now we're going to uh, declare that they, they're actually the answer to a completely different question, okay? to a completely different question that's naturally posed in this space to uh, begin with. Uh, what I want to do eventually, eventually, is just get the function of the z's and even do the integrals. Okay, so uh, I really want to perform the integrals over these loops, and uh, and understand the transcendental functions uh, uh, that I get. It's just that, um, uh, yeah. So the, the the hope is if we understand this part of the story perfectly, it'll tell us something about so uh, the the nature of the answer. Integrand. This is still the integral. This is still, and that's why we're only dealing with rational functions. Okay, very complicated, <laughs> but. But, uh, but uh, rational functions. Okay? There's an enormous amount that has been learned about the incredibly intricate and remarkable structures in the final answers, in the polylogarithms. And uh, uh, so there's lots and lots of, um, uh, there's lots of beautiful things that show up in the final answer, but which are clearly connected to the structures that we're seeing internally. So, so we, want to, uh, we want to understand things properly and, uh, and understand everything that we can uh, correctly about this, and hopefully that sets it up in a way that makes doing the integrations obvious. Let me just, just as a, just as a tiny teaser uh, along those lines, since, since, since you asked the uh, question, you see, even you take this very simple expression, the one that we just uh, talked about, x1, x2, x3, x4, okay? And, and since uh, Feynman wrote these things down 60 years ago, People have written down expressions like this. Maybe not exactly these variables, but substantially expressions like this. And then you have to learn how to integrate them over x. Maybe x is in Euclidean space or in Minkowski space. So you have to learn how to in integrate them. However, it wasn't until four years ago, as a consequence of the talks in this room, that, uh, that we realized that this is secretly a bunch of d logs. Okay. Now, in this case, it's simple enough to verify that it's true. But even the fact that it's true was not uh, uh, seen for a long time. Let me tell you what it is. And it's so, sort of, uh, so uh, x1, x2, x3, x4 are four points in R4, or we're really in R22, right, in the picture that we have. We can go back and think about them, if you like, as four lines in P3. And you know that there's two lines that intersect all four. So those are two points, let's say x star 1 and x star 2. Pick any one of them that you want. Then the d log of these expressions is equal to this thing that we want to be integrating. Okay? Uh, this thing is not obviously 4 d logs, but it is 4 d logs. 
And in fact, this is true of everything. It's true of every integrand. All the integrands are expressed as sums of d logs, even though they're not remotely, obviously, uh, come out like that uh, from uh, Feynman diagrams. Okay? So um, that, fact is, uh, that fact is just hardwired into the entire story that I'm going to tell you. Because the whole story I'm going to tell you is going to produce the answer as the sums of pieces in these triangulations that are just individually all d logs. But, it, but, to, to, but to come to your question again, Pierre, this fact that they're d logs strongly suggests it should be easy to integrate them. <laughs> okay? So you, you found the sort of right variables to make them as uh, simple as possible. And um, uh, so, um, uh, so that, that's why we'd like to understand this uh, as, as, as well as possible uh, in order to hopefully tell us also how to uh, integrate. What we'd really like to do is know how to uh, integrate them so well that we can sum the entire perturbative expansion, uh, put the coupling constant back in, we can sum the entire perturbative expansion that has a finite radius of convergence in this limit. And we know that if we go to the strong coupling, all of this stuff should turn into strings and anti de Sitter space and all, all the rest of it is, uh, is, um, is uh, supposed to come out of this theory in the limit where the coupling becomes strong. But in order to be able to understand all that, of course, we have to be able to uh, know how to do the integrals and, uh, and uh, so on. Can you see semi-classical okay. stuff too? Um, well, we can already see semi-classical stuff even without, yeah, yeah. Well, semi-classical stuff is, is uh, the semi-classical yeah, stuff like sure. orbits. Yeah, I mean, semi-classical stuff like orbits and, uh, and, and things like that are follow in a pretty well-known way once you know basic things just about the singularities of these objects. Okay. And the singularities are what's uh, made as transparent as possible by the, by the geometry. So all that semi-classical stuff comes out in a, in, a relatively simple, in a relatively simple way. All right, so that was more about the physics that I wanted to say. Uh, so let's transition to talking about the uh, geometry. And let me stick. So, uh, so, so, we're, so the the geometry is labeled by exactly the same things and one more variable. Um, uh, it, well, let, let me stick with the trees first. It's labeled by n and k and another variable m, which is equal to four. Uh, it, at least most I, most obviously in the discussion. That, that, that we had before. This is the tree, this is the tree amplitohedron. And, um, and this lives inside uh, the space of k planes in k plus m dimensions. Okay. So, so, if, if, so um, uh, and I'm going to imagine that, uh, that I, have ex uh, I have external data z1 through zn now, which are not four vectors like they were before, um, or not even m vectors, uh, but they're going to be m plus k dimensional. OK, so all the information about the super stuff is going into these extra k components of this, uh, of this uh, object. OK? And, um, and just in order to be able to say who is the extra part versus who is the, uh, the m-dimensional part, uh, there's also a k-plane in k plus m dimensions. So there's a k-plane y, uh, which is a k-plane, which is the, the y's are labeling uh, um, the, the points in gk k plus m. So you have a k-plane in, k, in k plus m dimensions. And uh, in order to talk about what I mean by the top four components of the z, let's say if m equals four, what I mean is I project this data, k plus m, through uh, all the vectors in the k-plane to go from uh, k plus m dimensional vectors to m dimensional vectors. So if m is four, uh, those four dimensional vectors are the bosonic data that I was talking about. Okay? Um, but, uh, but as far as defining the space, this is the this is the this is the external data is uh, n k plus m dimensional vectors, and in in a gk k plus m, there's going to be some region. There's some uh, there's some 
uh, simply define region. And uh, to motivate the region, it's all motivated by uh, generalizing um, polygons and, uh, and uh, polytopes. So if I think about all the points in the, uh, uh, projectively inside this uh, polygon, uh, all those points I can think of as being a linear combination of the external uh, of the of the of the z's uh, specifying the external points, um, but with all the c's being positive. Okay, so if all the c's are positive, then I'm uh, uh, or all negative. But but from now on, I'll just uh, uh, um, I'll abuse terminology and say the word positive instead of all positive and all, or, or all negative. Okay, so so uh, so if I if I fix the, if I fix these z's, so the z's are three dimensional vectors. Uh, so projectively, there are these points. If I fix the z's, and I uh, span over all positive c's, then I'll cover the interior of this. Uh, I'll cover the interior of this polygon. And of course, it, it, yes, that's right. And and so of course, it's also important uh, for this picture that the z's are convex, and the convexity of the of the z's is guaranteed by saying that these three by three determinants made out of the z's are all positive if they're ordered. OK? So that's what the inside of a polygon is. is, a, uh, is, a, uh, is there's positive external data, positive in the sense that all the ordered minors are positive, and you're adding them up positively. <laughs> it's a positive sum of positive external data. Uh, for fixed external data and scanning over all Cs, this uh, fills up the inside of the polygon. And I can do this for, now I can do this for any polytope. Uh, I, can do it for any, I can do it for any polytope at all. Uh, if I take literally this, this construction and I just go to higher dimensions, then I'm not getting a random polytope. I'm getting a very special polytope, which is the, uh, which is the cyclic polytope. Okay, so, so if I just take, uh, if I take uh, but exactly the same construction, I now go to uh, uh, higher dimensions, and this is giving me the inside Don't of the cyclic the polytope. Sorry? No, no, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this all projectively. Ah, okay? So I'm, okay. I'm doing it all projectively so that the, uh, the uh, divided by the sum over all the c's is, uh, uh, happens automatically. All right? So this is, the, this, is the, this is the basic notion that we're going to uh, generalize. And uh, sorry? Uh, uh, here, uh, well, uh, here there is a cyclic symmetry which is built in to what I mean by by giving the ordering to these minors. Okay, so so by saying by saying that uh, by saying that this polygon is convex, it's if I order the vertices, right? That the polygon one, four, three, two, five would not be convex. So the the cyclic structure came in in demanding that all of these minors were positive when they're ordered in some ordering one one through n. Uh, that's right. It's invariant under cyclic symmetry, and, and we'll see that that's uh, that the whole structure is going to have exactly the uh, uh, cyclic symmetry. So, in fact, just just uh, continuing on, just from uh, this example, there's this general notion of uh, positivity in the uh, Grassmannian. If we imagine, given a k plane in n dimensions, so so we're given a k by n matrix whose rows are the span of the rows are giving me the, the uh, plane. Um, so let me just call it sort of a general matrix here. Sometimes I have the uh, notation uh, uh, C for them. Uh, then there's a, there's a notion of kind of the analog of the inside of a simplex um, uh, in the uh, Grassmannian is the positive Grassmannian. And that's the case where all these ordered minors are positive if A1 is less than AK. Okay, so I order the columns and I demand that all the minors are positive. This notion of positivity uh, has a uh, has a uh, 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 is almost cyclically invariant. It has an annoying minus sign, um, but it does have a twisted cyclic symmetry. Under C one goes to T C two, C two to C three, and the last one has to pick up minus one to the k minus one times the first one. Um, uh, and if you do that, then everything is, is uh, still positive. So there's this little twisted cyclic symmetry. OK, but now let's uh, talk about the, uh, the generalization of this formula to the amplitohedron. So, it's, uh, so uh, 
Uh, so I, I don't just have one y, but I have ky's. Okay? Uh, and the span of those ky's is going to give me, um, uh, is going to give me the k-plane in k plus m dimensions. Um, so this alpha runs from 1 to k. And so I want to consider all y's that are a linear combination of my external data. These are the, uh, the, the z's, um, which are still positive in exactly the same ways we had before. And so I want to consider linear combinations of them. So that's summed, summed over a. Okay. All right. So, uh, so I want to fix this, and I want to sum over all. Uh, I want to fix the z's, and I want to scan over all, uh, all c's. But I want to have some notion of positivity for the c's, just like I did for the polygon. And so I will demand that the c's are positive in the sense of the positive Grassmannian. Okay. So these, so 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 the c's are in the positive Grassmannian g plus kn. And again, that just means that all the ordered minors for the c's are positive. And we're scanning over them. And the z's are fixed data, fixed external data. And uh, here it means that za1 through za k plus m, because this k plus m dimensional, are all positive. OK? So that's, uh, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, if you like, this is the generalization of the cyclic polytope into the Grassmannian. That's the most direct, uh, that's the most direct generalization it is. We, we think of it as a double generalization, where the positive Grassmannian generalizes triangle or simplex. And then, in this, uh, and then this c dot z map is generalizing the notion of a polytope into the Grassmannian. Okay? Now, in fact, you can, you, can, uh, you can define this map not just when the z's are positive, just like for ordinary polytopes. We didn't have to have all the z's are, uh, are, are positive. The, the, the central idea is you want to make sure that this map is always projectively well defined. So you want to make sure that it's impossible for the right-hand side to ever go to 0. So it's impossible for the left-hand side to ever be 0. That clearly makes some positivity demands on the things that appear on the right-hand side. And this is the most trivial way of satisfying them. And that's perhaps why the cyclic polytope is the amplest polytope somehow. Okay? Or something, there's something natural about it. But certainly, you can take any polytope uh, whose vertices are the z's will clearly satisfy this. Okay? So, uh, so there's so you can uh, so there's a more general notion of a Grassmann polytope that you could talk about. Uh, Thomas Lamb had a paper, uh, maybe other, other people, uh, talking about the uh, constraints on the z's that are necessary for this map to be well defined in general. Um, so so in a sense that the, the whole subject is is about uh, Grassmannian generalizations of polytopes, but uh, the amplitohedron is the Grassmannian generalization of the cyclic polytope, and um, that's what uh, we'll be talking about. Um, and a final point to make here, uh, which uh, has to do with this annoying twisted cyclic symmetry, is that this annoying twisted cyclic symmetry is actually absent if m is even. If m is even, um, the amplitohedron is just cyclically invariant, or I mean, by which I mean is, is acted on by a cyclic symmetry directly. And that's because the minus sign that you pick up on the last co uh, column of C is matched by the minus sign you pick up on the last column of Z when M is even. Okay, so when M is even, uh, these objects are cyclically invariant. When M is odd, they're not. And that's also well known about cyclic polytopes. Cyclic polytopes are cyclic when, uh, when they're in. Uh, so is the uh, y yeah. the amplitudehedron? Is that what you're calling it? Yes. That, so so, so, so this, this geometry inside GKK plus M is the tree amplitohedron. Okay. This is the tree amplitohedron. And we'll be talking about trees for a uh, little while. And th this was our usual definition of the uh, amplitohedron. OK, I think I, I even gave a talk about this here a couple of years ago. But now let me talk about, uh, let me talk about the new picture, finally. Let me, let me do it here, actually. Uh, so there, there's a few funny things about this. Um, uh, I mean, it's perfectly fine, but uh, a few funny things. Well, purely, purely from this point of view, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you think back to the physics, uh, it was strange that, we, that we're dealing with supersymmetry in this way, but these extra k, uh, uh, this extra k part uh, to all, all, all the z's. In other words, 
uh, physics really doesn't have external data in k plus m dimensions, right? It has, uh, it just has momenta, ordinary particles, nor does it have this k-plane, okay? So they've always felt like some sort of auxiliary uh, construct. Um, but anyway, certainly this, 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 this makes perfect sense, but it's, uh, but it's one motivation for, uh, for, for searching for another picture that's maybe more intrinsically m-dimensional and doesn't have all these extra uh, components. Um, but uh, but that's, that's the kind of a vague motivation from uh, physics. More directly and practically, um, uh, we, have, uh, we just have the, the simple pragmatic question uh, that this isn't a very useful way of checking whether a point is in the amplitohedron or not. <laughs> okay? so, and we can even go back to the case of uh, polygons. Um, so if someone just hands you a point and you want to check, is it inside the polygon or not inside the polygon, then if the only definition you know, knew is that y is c dot z, you have to hunt around and see if it's possible to express the point as a positive combination of all the external vertices. And it's a, it's a very many to one map. That's another way of saying it. It's a highly redundant map because the, the space of c's is much higher dimensional than the, uh, the space in which the uh, polygon or the amplitohedron lives. Okay, so that's, that's one, so that's a very practical question. You know, just on the computer, someone hands you a Y, you want to check it in the amplitude or not, how do you check it? <clears throat> okay, so, um, so we, we want a more intrinsic, a more invariant uh, definition for what uh, Y is. Um, well, in, uh, for, for, for whether a point is uh, in or out. Now, in the, in the case of polygons and polytopes, is a very, a very classic and standard way of talking about this. There's two standard ways of talking about a polytope. The vertex center, at least two, uh, the two that, there's a sort of vertex centered uh, way, the thing that cares about the vertices, which is the convex hall idea, this one. And then there's a, uh, there's a, there, there's a definition that cares about the faces, um, which cuts out the polytope by a bunch of inequalities. Okay? So, we have, the, so uh, we have this y is c dot z picture, that's a sort of vertex based. And then we have another one which says that y, uh, together with a whole bunch of boundaries, is a positive. Okay? And, um, okay, so, um, so this is the one which is effective, right? Someone hands you a point, that's the fast way of checking whether it's inside or outside. You just check these inequalities and see if they're all satisfied. So we'd like to find, uh, we'd like to find some analog of this for the uh, amplitohedron. And um, you can ask whether the most obvious thing works. The most obvious thing is to find the obvious co-dimension one boundaries of the amplitohedron and just check uh, whether just applying the obvious co-dimension one boundaries is enough to force y to be inside uh, uh, the amplitohedron. Now, so let me tell you what the obvious co-dimension one boundaries are. And let me restrict myself to even m for now. A little later, we'll see that m equals 1 is actually the sort of master behind the scenes of uh, everything. Um, but, uh, but let's uh, restrict ourselves to even m. And let me even just do m equals 2. Um, then it is easy to see that for any k, if y is, uh, if y is in the amplitohedron, then y is always on the uh, uh, same side of all these all these boundaries, okay? Where you always have to be careful if it's uh, uh, because of this twisted cyclic symmetry. For example, if k equals two, it's not n one; it's one n. Okay? But 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 uh, modulo the uh, the twisted cyclic symmetry. These are all the uh, obvious boundaries. Let me just give you a quick sketch of why this is true. Uh, it's true because. Um, if I, if I write y is equal to c dot z, then I can expand this expression. Well, let me just remind you when, when k equals 1. So when k equals 1, um, this just becomes c1 times 1 za za plus 1 plus c2, 2 za za plus 1, and so on, plus cn. Uh, sorry, I'm mixing notation. z1, z2, cn, zn. Z a Z a plus one, and so all the C's are positive, but also all these brackets are positive because uh, because the Z's are uh, if the Z's are ordered, uh, you're you're positive, and because these come in pairs, um, now if I put a distance between them, if this was a, 
uh, not adjacent, then it's not true. Because you might get a term that's stuck, uh, stuck between them that has the opposite sign. Um, but, uh, but, um, but if they're together, then this is, uh, these are the uh, obvious boundaries. And this argument extends to any k. For example, if, if I have any k, here, uh, instead of getting the c, I just get the corresponding minor uh, of the c's, a1 to ak. And then here, I just get a1 to ak, and then za, za plus 1 the sum of all of them, and exactly the same argument goes through. These things are ordered. They're positive when they're ordered. And these things are all positive as well. In fact, this generalizes. So for m equals 2, the obvious boundaries are, let me write it as y i i plus 1. Uh, for m equals 4, it generalizes as i i plus 1, j j plus 1, and so on. So they just come in, come in pairs like that. Okay? So those, those are the obvious, uh, obvious co-dimension 1 boundaries. So, so the first question is, is that enough? So um, are the co-dimension boundaries, boundaries enough? And of course, the answer is no. Most of the richness of this uh, subject, is, uh, as you'll see, is because the answer is no. But let's just see why, in the very simplest case of uh, k equals 2, uh, m equals 2, they are boundaries, but they're not sufficient. Boundaries. They are boundaries. They are boundaries, but they're not. Uh, so so um, what, what the picture is is the following. If you just impose these boundaries, it divides the uh, Grassmannian up into a bunch of regions, mostly almost disjoint regions. Okay? They're really divided into a bunch of almost disjoint regions. Um, they're not completely disjoint. They meet, but not on co-dimension 1 boundaries. They meet on pretty low dimensional, quite low dimensional uh, boundaries. Okay, and so we need more to cut out the one that we want. Okay, and that's uh, that's um, that's uh, and that'll turn out to be a very simple topological requirement. And we can phrase the entire thing, even getting rid of the requirement of uh, asking about these boundaries. Uh, there's a topological picture and a completely combinatorial picture, and I'm, and I will uh, uh, give you the uh, uh, I'll tell you both of them. But just 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 to get an idea of what the challenge is. And let me just get to this much, um, and then I'll stop. And then we can keep going for whoever wants to uh, chat more about it. But just to give you an idea why this isn't enough, um, uh, uh, for that case, k equals 2, n equals 2, uh, um, sorry, m equals 2 k equals 2 and n equals 4. Actually, let me say just slightly more generally, when n is equal to k plus m, uh, when n equals k plus m, the z matrix is, is just k by k plus m dimensional, so we can set it to the identity. And in this case, the amplitohedron is the same as the positive Grassmannian. So it also generalizes the positive Grassmannian in a, in a simple way. So let's actually stick with that case, m equals 2, k equals 2, n equals 4. And in this case, uh, we can just say what all the inequalities are. So when I say that y is equal to c dot z, it immediately tells me the following things. It tells me that y12 is positive, y23 is positive, y34 is positive, y14 is positive. But the fact that the minors of c are positive uh, tells me that y13 is actually negative and y24 is negative. Okay, so in this simple case, these are the inequalities that cut out the amplitohedron. That shouldn't surprise you when it's a positive Grassmannian. The positive Grassmannian is specified by just giving a bunch of inequalities, so all the minors positive. I'm just translating that into this uh, y space. But you can see why it's not enough to just say these. Okay? It's not enough to just say these because while there is famously a Pluca relation that tells you about these guys, OK? Uh, if I, and if I tell you, so in the usual the positive Grassmannian, you say if all these minors are positive, um, this is the reason why these guys are boundaries, but those aren't. Because 
uh, I can't send them to zero before sending one of these guys uh, to zero. Okay? So that, that's why I said the entire richness of the subject has to do with exactly these, uh, these uh, Plucker relations and the way the plus signs make an appearance in the Plucker relations. But if I don't tell you anything other than the signs of these guys, then, then it's compatible with either these both being positive or both being negative. Okay? And that is, that's why uh, it's almost uh, breaking this space up into disjoint pieces. Okay? Uh, you have to go to pretty high dimensional boundaries before they actually meet. Okay? So it's not enough to just say the inequalities. We need something that detects uh, the, the correctness of the, of, of the signs here. Okay? That's right. Here there are here there are exactly. There are two pieces where they're both positive or they're both both negative. All right. So now let me tell you what the new picture is. Let me just say quickly what the what what the picture is and then as I said we can stop and have further discussions if anyone's interested. So the idea is in order to decide whether something is or isn't in the amplitohedron um, what we're going to do is, is look at the whole configuration. So we have some Zs and we have, some, and we have this Y. But we're going to project everything through Y. Okay, so we, we, we start with a K plus M. We start with a K plus M dimensional space. And here we have a K plane Y. And we have our data, which is Z1 up to Zn. These are K plus M dimensional vectors. But, uh, but I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to go from here to an m-dimensional space. So I'm going to project through y. And I'm going to end up with an m-dimensional space. Let me call these m-dimensional vectors little z's. OK, so these are going to be m-dimensional. Now, what do I mean by, by, uh, by, by, by project through y? Um, I just mean. That, uh, uh, that I'm going to look at the, uh, the equivalence class of all the vectors up to anything in the direction of y. Okay, So that, 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 that takes me from k plus m dimensions to uh, m dimensions. So are, are y your boundaries here or not? No, y is, y is, a, I mean, y is some point uh, in gk k plus m. It's some k plane. I'm trying to decide whether y is in the amplitude or not. Okay. Okay? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to project through y to go from k plus m dimensions down to an m-dimensional picture. Okay, so y is going to go to the origin in this picture. y is mapped to the origin. So algebraically, I can do a transformation to put y to the form of zeros and a k by k identity block. And then I'm just the, the, the little z's are just the uh, top m components uh, of that. Okay. So all of the action is going to be in this m-dimensional space now. Okay? And we're going to see what this m-dimensional space looks like. And as we'll see, it has some topological properties that tell you when you're in the amplitohedron. Right? But let's go back to this uh, simple example and see uh, what it looks like there. So, so this is uh, k equals 2, n equals 2, uh, n equals 4, m equals 2. So the picture is two-dimensional. Y has gone to the origin. So there's an origin. I'll put a Y there, but it's been mapped to the origin. And I'm going to draw two pictures. Remember, uh, uh, here I'm, I'm still exploring the idea to say that I'm on the right side of the boundary. So Y, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 1, 4 are all positive. That means in this picture that 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4 say that they all have, to, uh, they all have the same orientation uh, going around, around Y. Okay? So, so this is 1 to 2, 3, 4. Okay? And you'll notice 1, 4 is, uh, uh, 4, 1 is backwards, 1, 4 is in the right direction, and that's exactly the, uh, what, what, I, what I need. Okay? So that's one way that it could look. But here's another way that it could look. Here's y. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? So these are, those, are two different, uh, those are two different pictures for y. Um, in both cases, all the boundaries are right. right? 
because everything is winding around in the same direction. But I just said the, the obvious word. What distinguishes the uh, two of these guys? Well, first notice, of course, here, this guy is in the amplitohedron because y13 is negative and y1 uh, and y24 is negative. Okay, because 2, 4 is going backwards. 3, 1 is going backwards. Whereas here, y13 and y24 are both positive. Okay, so this guy is in the amplitohedron and this is out. Okay, is that clear from, right, from, from, from that picture, right? Okay, so what's the difference between these two pictures? It's that here, the curve, two, three, or the line segments, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one, has a winding number one around y, and here it has winding number zero. OK. Now, in fact, the claim is that, that is the, that's the correct general idea. So for example, if we, stick with, uh, if we stick with k equals always m equals 2, if I stick with m equals 2, then I have, uh, if I stick with m equals 2, then I have, um, always have a two-dimensional picture, no matter what. Um, then, uh, and let's say I have uh, k equals 2 again, then the claim is that it always looks like that. It always looks like something like this, and it has winding number one. Okay, So it could have winding number one or zero. And it turns out that one is the maximal winding that it could have. Okay? Given that the z's were, po if the z's were random, if the underlying z's were random, we could have huge winding. But if the underlying z's are positive, then there's a, there's a restriction for a, how much winding you could have after you project. Okay? So this is another way of saying what this, uh, what, what, what we're exploring here is that the underlying z's were positive. But it's a natural question to ask, after you project to the amplitohedron, what do they look like? Are they positive? <laughs> you know, they're not. They're not in general positive. Uh, but they have this, uh, they have this uh, topological, uh, they have this, uh, uh, topological property. Right? So, so, so that's the first, uh, that is the first uh, Definition. Then, and let me just, uh, I'll, I'll just state without, uh, well, actually, we don't yet have a complete proof that this definition is the same as the uh, first definition of the amplitude, that it's the same as the C dot Z definition, but it's, it, uh, uh, w there is actually a proof for, uh, for low enough M. When, F, F, when M is 1, I, I haven't told you about odd M yet, but uh, when M is M1 and 2, there's a, there's a very simple proof. But, um, but for general M, we don't have, uh, we don't have a proof, but it's, uh, but it's been exhaustively checked uh, to be true numerically. So it's, it's, it's very likely true. Uh, but, but let me tell you what, uh, what, 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 what this statement is. Um, so when M equals 2 and K equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay, uh, the windings are, one, one, two, two, three, three, and so on. Okay. Um, so they're in general just given by the floor of k plus one over two. And why is there a difference between even and odd? It's just that stupid twisted cyclic symmetry. Okay. If I had k equals one, for example, uh, that's what it would look like. It's just the interior of a uh, polygon, but it's but the n one is is uh, uh, yn n1 would be positive rather than 1n positive. So because we have this possibility for what to do with the n's, um, the same winding uh, can be associated with uh, two, two different spaces. OK? Now, uh, let me give you the answer for general even m. And then there's a very similar story for odd m, but, I, but I'll, 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 I'll skip it. Um, so uh, uh, first, let me also just quickly say, operationally, how are we checking this winding number? <laughs> See, computing the winding number is uh, is just uh, uh, is just 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 the question. I mean, given any curve, whether it looks like this or not, and given the origin, I pick any vector that I like, and I just go out in the direction of that vector, and I ask how many of the boundaries do I hit, uh, up to sign of the orientation. Okay, uh, so that's uh, so. So, uh, so the sum over the uh, 
the, the sum over the hits um, uh, uh, with sine uh, is the is the the sum over all these i plus ones of the of the i plus ones uh, that are hit is the unwinding number in this case. Now, what's the notion for in general? So when we go to m equals four, now we have uh, now we have points in four dimensions, and I want to talk about a notion of winding. So I want to uh, so here I had a natural one-dimensional space which is made out of the i plus ones, and it was closed. The sum of all the i plus ones is closed. Well, the 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 natural generalization of that uh, for uh, m equals four is all the i plus one jj plus ones. Okay. So if I look at that collection of simplices, it's also closed. That's the general. That's also those are also standardly known as the boundaries of the polytope. 